You've seen it happen. You spend a ton of money on a new deck, using all the latest treated lumber, and in what feels like just a few years, it's already starting to get soft spots. It's turning to compost. Meanwhile, you look at pictures of these ancient buildings, like the Horyuji Temple in Japan, with wood that was cut down in the year 594. It's still standing. It gets you asking the same question researchers have been asking. Why do our expensive modern projects fall apart, while these ancient wooden structures seem to last forever? Well, in the deep, dark forests of Norway, there are some buildings that hold a secret, a secret written in wood that has survived almost a thousand years of brutal snow, ice, and wind. What did these medieval builders know that we've forgotten? The Enduring Enigma To really get how incredible this is, you have to understand the enemy these buildings have been fighting for 800 years, the Norwegian climate. This is not a gentle place. The winters are long and crushingly heavy with snow. The coasts get hammered with salty winds, and inland, the temperatures swing like crazy, making materials expand and contract over and over. And the biggest enemy of all is moisture. Rain, snow, fog, it's the perfect recipe for rot, for fungus, bacteria, and bugs that love to eat wood. From a modern point of view, building a huge wooden structure here is just asking for disaster. Our modern wooden homes, even with all our high-tech sealants and pressure-treated lumber, need constant work. A deck might get you 15 years, a frame maybe 30. And yet, you can go to the Lairdal Valley and see the Borgunstav Church. Built somewhere around 1200 AD, it has stood up to all of it for the better part of a millennium. It looks like something from a fantasy novel, all layered and tiered, almost like it grew right out of the ground. The name Stav Church comes from its bones, massive vertical wood posts, or staves, that hold the whole thing up. It's one of only 28 of these medieval churches left, out of maybe 2,000 that used to cover the country. So how did they do it? How did builders, centuries before modern chemistry or power saws, make a wooden building that could outlast stone? They didn't have a magic formula. Their power came from a kind of knowledge we've almost completely lost, a knowledge born from generations of just watching, of trial and error, and having a deep relationship with the forest itself. They didn't just use wood, they understood it, and that's where the secret begins. A land forged in ice and legend. Before Christianity came to Norway, these guys were the undisputed masters of wood. The whole Viking Age was defined by it. The symbol of that era isn't a building, it's the longship. Those ships were technological marvels, light, strong, and scary fast. They were built with this gut-level understanding of how to bend and join wood to make it both flexible and tough enough to handle the North Atlantic. These guys were the grand masters of woodworking. Then, things changed, Christianity arrived, and this new religion needed something the Old Norse faith didn't. Big, impressive, permanent churches. While the rest of Europe was building cathedrals out of stone, the builders in Norway turned to the one material they knew inside and out. But they had a huge challenge. How do you take the technology for a flexible ship and turn it into a static building that's supposed to stand for centuries? Well, it turns out, the answer wasn't to throw out their old knowledge, but to adapt it. Their first try at building churches was pretty simple. They just stuck the posts right in the ground. And predictably, in the damp Norwegian soil, they rotted out in a few decades. None of them survive. It was a critical failure that forced them to get creative. This is where you see the genius happen. Look at the surviving stave churches. You see those snarling dragon heads on the gables? Those aren't just leftover pagan symbols on a Christian church. They're direct descendants of the prows on Viking longships. And they're also brilliantly functional. They're water spouts that shoot rain away from the walls. This one feature tells the whole story, a perfect mix of culture, history, and clever practical design. They took the knowledge their ancestors perfected on the sea and aimed it at the sky. If you're fascinated by how ancient wisdom solves modern problems, hit that like button and subscribe. It helps me bring you more stories like this. The Secret Life of Trees
The builder's genius started long before the first axe hit a tree. It began with a walk in the woods. Their first secret wasn't a technique, it was a choice, picking the right tree and preparing it in a process that took years. They didn't just clear-cut a patch of forest. They were picky. They looked for a specific tree, Scott's pine growing high on cold mountainsides. They didn't want young, fast-growing trees. They wanted old, slow-growing pines, hundreds of years old. The slow growth created wood with super-dense growth rings, making it naturally strong. But the real prize was the heartwood. In these old pines, the heartwood gets saturated with a thick protective resin. They called this wood malmfuru, or ore pine, because it was so dark, heavy, and almost like metal. This stuff was naturally resistant to rot and bugs. Once they picked the perfect tree, they didn't just cut it down, they performed a carefully orchestrated process. First, they would remove the tree's top and branches. Then they would cut a ring out of the bark at the bottom of the trunk. This action, known as girdling, starts the tree on a slow death. But here's the amazing part. As the tree died, still standing, it did something remarkable. It basically went into self-preservation mode and pumped its core full of all its remaining resin, bleeding upward and out through the cut branches. The Norwegians called this blocking. It's like the tree was marinating itself in its own natural preservative. The tree would stand like this for 15 to 20 years. Yes, years, slowly drying from the inside out. This natural seasoning meant the wood wouldn't crack or warp later on. By the time they finally cut it down, usually in winter when the tree was driest, it wasn't just wood anymore. It was a material that nature itself had transformed to be stronger, more stable, and almost immune to decay. This was the raw material they used to build for eternity. The Bones of the Building A Symphony of Joinery Okay, so they have this perfect resin-soaked timber. Now what? How do you assemble it so it can handle crushing snow loads and stay dry? Their solution was a masterclass in engineering, a system of interlocking joints that let the whole building breathe without falling apart. First, the most important innovation, they got the wood off the damp ground. Learning from those early churches that rotted from the bottom up, they built the entire church on a foundation of flat stones. On top of these stones, they laid a frame of heavy wooden beams. The whole structure was built on top of this frame. A simple, brilliant idea that lifted the wood away from moisture and let air circulate underneath, keeping everything dry. Giving the church stone feet is one of the biggest reasons they're still here. The skeleton of the building was formed by those massive corner posts, the staving. These were whole tree trunks of that ore pine shaped into giant pillars. They were locked into the sill beams below with incredibly precise joints that also shielded the connection from rain. The walls weren't logs, they were vertical planks called tillene. These planks were slotted into grooves at the top and bottom. The final plank was often wedge-shaped and hammered in to tighten the whole wall. This system had a remarkable property, flexibility, wood swells and shrinks with humidity. A rigid nailed building fights that movement and eventually cracks, but the stave church could expand and contract, breathe with the seasons. It was a living structure. The roof, though, was the crowning achievement. This is where you can really see their shipbuilding heritage. To hold up the insane weight of the roofs and winter snow, they used a complex web of scissor trusses. It's a system of crisscrossing beams that creates strong triangles to transfer all that weight down through the posts to the foundation. If you stand inside and look up, it looks almost exactly like the inside of a Viking ship's hull, flipped upside down. They used the same principles that let a ship survive ocean waves to build a roof that could survive a mountain of snow. But here's where recent research has revealed something fascinating. For years, architects assumed entire wall sections were assembled on the ground and then tilted into place like raising a barn. But advanced 3D modeling and analysis of the actual joints showed this was impossible. The overlapping corner connections of the horizontal beams made tilting complete walls physically impossible. 
Instead, these medieval builders erected each column individually, one by one, working from scaffolding to add components as they went up. It was more like growing the building than assembling it. This sequential construction method required even more precision and planning than we thought. The truth about no nails, a recent discovery. For years, people claimed these churches were built without a single nail. It became an internet legend, shared millions of times, 800-year-old church, not a single nail. But here's what's amazing. Recent research from the Technical University of Munich just revealed the truth, and it's even more impressive than the myth. They did use nails, over 11,000 of them in Borgund alone. But here's the genius. Every single nail was carved from wood. Over 10,000 wooden nails, called tree nails, held the roof shingles in place. Another 1,200 secured the main structure together. And 40% of these wooden nails had a special feature that shows the depth of their engineering knowledge, a wedge driven into them. Think about what happens to wood over time. It dries out. It shrinks. With a regular nail, this would create gaps and loose connections. But with these wedged wooden nails, as the wood aged and shrank, the wedges tightened automatically, making the connection stronger over time, not weaker. The same technique they had perfected on Viking ships, where loose joints in a storm meant death. Why wooden nails instead of iron? Simple. Iron rusts, especially in Norway's wet climate. Rust weakens and expands, cracking the wood around it. Iron creates rigid points in a structure that needs to flex. But wooden nails? They move with the building, they breathe with it, they expand and contract at the same rate as the surrounding timber, and they last just as long as the structure itself. It's not about avoiding technology, it's about choosing the right technology for the job. In places where they needed curved, load-bearing pieces like the arched knees that reinforced the structure, they didn't try to bend straight wood. They went back to the forest and found trees with naturally curved roots, where the grain sweeps down from the trunk into the root buttresses. These pieces, harvested from old tree stumps, were incredibly strong because the grain followed the curve. No weak points, no forcing the material, just finding what nature had already created and putting it where it was needed. The dragon's skin, an armor of tar. Even with the best wood and the best joinery, the churches needed one last line of defense. They needed a skin to shield them from the sun and rain. That skin was a thick, black, sticky substance, pine tar. And this wasn't just any tar. Making it was a specialized craft, almost like alchemy. They'd take pine stumps and roots, which are super rich in resin, and stack them in a funnel-shaped kiln called a mile. They'd light the top on fire, then cover it with layers of peat and turf to starve it of oxygen. This caused the wood to smolder and bake for days, a process called destructive distillation. As it cooked, a thick, oily tar would sweat out of the wood and trickle down into a collection barrel. This pine tar is amazing stuff. It's incredibly water-repellent, but it's more than a raincoat. It also has natural chemicals that kill the fungus and bacteria that cause rot. It was the same technology they used to protect the hulls of their longships. The stave churches were literally painted in this tar, which is what gives them their signature dark, almost black look. But it wasn't a one and done deal. Retarring the church was a communal ritual. Every few years, the whole community would come together to reapply the building's protective armor. It was an act of constant care, a covenant between the people and their church. That smoky, resinous smell that still clings to the wood today? That's the smell of survival. The endangered craft of today. But there's something urgent happening right now. The knowledge isn't just historical, it's actively disappearing. Today, fewer than six traditional pine tar makers remain in all of Norway. Think about that. Six people, a single stave church, might need hundreds of gallons of tar for one application. But these last craftsmen, they can only produce a few gallons at a time using traditional methods. Without tar made the right way, these churches will eventually fail. Modern alternatives exist. Factory-made wood oils from China, synthetic preservatives, but they don't have the same properties. They don't breathe the same way. They don't smell the same. 
and more importantly, using them means we lose the authentic appearance, the cultural continuity, the living connection to the past. Groups like the Nordic Tar Network are now racing against time. They're offering courses and demonstrations, working with road construction crews to salvage pine stumps that would otherwise be discarded as waste, trying to teach this dying craft to a new generation, because you can't preserve the churches without preserving the knowledge. So, if this way of building was so incredible, why did it disappear? Why are there only 28 of these churches left? It wasn't one single thing, but a slow decline. The first major blow was the Black Death in the mid-1300s. The plague wiped out more than half of Norway's population. With that loss of life came a devastating loss of knowledge. These skills weren't written in books. They were passed from master to apprentice, father to son in workshops and on scaffolding. When the masters died, entire generations of craft knowledge vanished. Later, the Protestant Reformation changed how churches were used. The new faith wanted more light, more openness. Walls were knocked out for bigger windows, which compromised the structural integrity. New technology like water-powered saws made it easier to build with simpler log construction. Why spend 20 years preparing a single tree when you could build a whole church in a season? By the 1800s, most of the remaining stave churches were just torn down to make way for bigger modern buildings. It was only because a few visionaries fought to save them that the last 28 were preserved. One man, Johann Christian Dahl, a painter and professor, waged a 15-year campaign to save the Vang Stave Church. When he couldn't find a place for it in Norway, he arranged for it to be transported to Germany, now Poland, where it was rebuilt in 1842 and still stands today. His efforts inspired the founding of the Society for the Preservation of Ancient Norwegian Monuments, which saved many of the churches we can still visit. But the legacy isn't lost. You can see it in the core principles of Scandinavian design, function, harmony with nature, and letting the material be what it is. As we look for more sustainable ways to build today, the lessons from these builders are more relevant than ever. They remind us that slowing down and working with nature, not against it, can create things that last, not just for decades, but for centuries. So what did those Norwegian builders know? The secret wasn't a single trick. It was a whole philosophy, a trinity of wisdom that modern builders are only now beginning to understand again. First was the wisdom of patience and selection. They knew that great buildings start with great materials, and they partnered with nature waiting years, even decades, to create the perfect rot-resistant wood. They didn't rush. They let the tree prepare itself for immortality. Second was the wisdom of architectural genius. They took their shipbuilding heritage and created a strong, flexible skeleton that could breathe and move with the seasons. They used over 11,000 wooden nails with wedges that got tighter with age. They found curved wood instead of forcing straight wood to bend. They built sequentially, piece by piece, growing the structure like a living thing. They outsmarted the climate by understanding it. And third was the wisdom of the protective skin and continuous care. They knew that even the best wood needs armor, and they maintained it with a ritual of care, coating their churches in layers of life-preserving pine tar. But more than that, they understood that preservation isn't a one-time act, it's a relationship, a covenant between each generation and the next. In our world of things designed to be thrown away, planned obsolescence and good enough for now, the Stave Church is a powerful challenge. A challenge that asks, what if we built things to outlast us? What if we honored the materials we use? What if we saw maintenance not as a burden but as a sacred duty? The knowledge wasn't lost. It's just been waiting in these dark, dragon-clad cathedrals for us to find it again. Waiting for us to slow down, to listen, to learn from those who built not for profit or convenience, but for eternity. What part of their philosophy speaks to you most? The patient preparation of the wood that took decades? The ingenious engineering that used 11,000 wooden nails? Or the protective ritual of tar-making that's now nearly extinct? Drop your thoughts in the comments below.
And if you believe ancient wisdom has lessons for our modern world, hit subscribe because we're just getting started exploring what the old masters knew that we've forgotten.